Okay, so I believe I am live now. Welcome to the Arts and Farts channel. Oh, do this one more sound check here. Okay. Excellent, excellent. All right, that was just a little extra brief sound check. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Arts and Farts channel. My name is Mark Jokic, uh, violinist. Um, and the, the program you're watching here is Where in the World is My Music Studio? And this is the third video uh, that I'm shooting for this. And I'm really pleased to have a very special guest. Uh, this is a, a teacher of mine for quite a few years, uh, David Russell violinist and a professor of violin. And I'm gonna give him an opportunity to introduce himself uh, after this uh, little brief introduction, but I'm really happy to have him here on uh, Where in the World is My Music Studio. And uh, if you're watching this years, months, years down the road, you probably know that uh, we are kind of currently on lockdown because of the pandemic, although you know the rules are kind of lightening now. It's seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still sort of spending a lot of time at home. So that's when this is all taking place. A uh, few people have asked me uh, where I got the idea for this um, show. And uh, it's kind of funny that the idea came to me during uh, this lockdown uh, because I was doing a, a program called Canada Performs. And during a, a little break I was taking from playing, I decided, oh, the, why not show uh, the viewers a little bit of my music studio uh, just to kind of kill time and rest before the next piece of music I was going to play and then the idea kind of came to me well you know music music studios music spaces are really interesting and you know a lot of people already do wonderful interviews with musicians and uh, I thought that maybe I could kind of specialize on this one aspect of a musician's life in their uh, in their space and I think and one thing I hope uh, from all of this is that uh, viewers whether a musician or you're a music enthusiast, or you're just kind of getting into loving music that you dedicate uh, a, a space in your home, doesn't have to be a whole room, but dedicate a space uh, to music appreciation, whether it's uh, uh, with an instrument or, or a place where you listen to music. Um, I think it's, it's great for people. And especially now, if we are spending a little bit more time at home to kind of have this uh, space in your home, it's not only good for you, but also if you have kids or guests, it's also a fantastic thing. So I hope that's kind of what everyone gets from this program. And uh, I'm going to now uh, admit uh, David Russell to the live stream. We'll do a little sound check just to make sure he is there. I'm gonna unmute. Here we go, unmute. How's this, does that work? I can hear you just fine, hello. Good, nice to see you, Mark. Good to see you too. <laughs> Thanks Hi, for uh, joining me on Arts and Farts on Where in the World is Your Music Studio? Well, just to be clear, I represent the arts part of this. Okay, so I don't know <laughs> where that leaves you, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fine. I think this is a fascinating idea that you have because you know, the longer we're in this world of the violin and with teaching, the more inevitable it is that the room in our home that we spend the time doing that is going to reflect things from our experience and our life. And I think it's fascinating what you're doing. Oh, thank you very much. And, and I hope that, you know, especially now that you, um, you know, for, for this interview, you probably took a little bit more time to look around your music studio, although I'm sure you already have, that uh, it might have given you a, a kind of creative way to in reflecting on you know, what it is to be a musician and, uh, you know, all things music, really. So I'm really glad that you are, you're totally supportive of the idea and that you, uh, that you agreed to be my guest. Uh, I'd actually first really like to let you give a formal introduction uh, of yourself to our viewers. A formal introduction. Not well, formal, but like, who are you, David Russell? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm a violinist and I've been at this business of teaching it for 40 years this year, if mm. you can imagine that. I mean, wow. it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around it, but I started very young. And in fact, I started the teaching up at uh, Meadowmount when Mr. Galamian was alive. Mm. And your father and uncle were students up there. And I'm sure you must have been around there at some point. I went there one summer. 
And well, then we met up, you and I met up at the Encore School for Strings where I taught for 23 years. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, I was delighted when you and your family, you know, your sister Denise and your whole family moved to Cleveland and we were able to work together at the Cleveland Institute of Music where, where I taught for 24 years. <laughs> and um, I still play concerts and do a lot of teaching. And in this strange, uh, this strange time that we're living in with this pandemic, um, I've been doing a lot of the online teaching, which is a whole new chapter I never could have envisioned. It's, it's not ideal, but in the adversity, we learned some things that are pretty creative too. That is so absolutely I, true, yeah. I, I come from a long line of violin pedagogues and um, I've been at the teaching thing for 40 years and I'm still playing concerts and I, I have, established two master classes, one in the Adirondack Mountains of New York and the other one called Masterclass Al Andalus in uh, Alcalá la Real, Spain, near Granada. And uh, I spend a lot of my time planning for those events. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's a couldn't have said it better myself. That's a wonderful overview of, of what you've been up to these days and uh, you're, you know, you're, you're continuing uh, you know, influence on uh, on young violinists as as a teacher as well. You know, for this interview, it's kind of funny. I'm going to be calling you Mr. Russell because uh, I called you Mr. Russell for years, and I wouldn't be able to actually kind of get in the habit of calling you David. And it's actually like very similar when I was in Boy Scouts. I've been in Boy Scouts for eight years. When I see an old scouter, uh, former scout leader, I can't call them by their first name. It's always Scouter Jim, Scouter Brian, Scouter Bill. You know. <laughs> I, I understand that completely, and I have I still have that syndrome. Uh, you know, Linda and David Cerrone, I worked with for so many decades, and the closest we ever came to a first name basis was LC and DC. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in the history of this violin world, Mr. Galamian, Mrs. Galamian, only called him Boss. <laughs> my God! Yeah, that's very. Uh, oh my God! So, so much to so much to look back and reflect on. You know, one thing I, I wanted to just kind of start off the interview with um, was just kind of giving uh, our viewers sort of a three hundred and sixty or once over, very briefly, of where you're sitting right now. This looks like your music space, right? It is. You would like to see the large view? Yeah, just, just give us a, a panning view of, of where you are. Let's wow. see. Can you see? Wow, this is fantastic. That is a music room. This is where the music lives, or some of it anyway. Yeah. In the disorder and more current stuff on the top of the piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And things to remind me of past events on the walls. That's <laughs> and, fantastic, yeah. Uh, usually, I'm facing the other direction to teach a lesson. Mm. But since the music studio is the focus of this, I have the camera turned backwards now. So That's fine. So it seems like when people first enter your place, they would know right away that you're a musician because it seems like the music studio is the first thing you see here. Yes. Here's the entrance from the front door. And boom. Yeah. There's the music room. I think it's inescapable. Yeah, yeah no doubt about it. Yeah. Musician lives here, so... That's fantastic, that's fantastic. You know, um, uh, it's it's really, my, my music studio is in the basement of, of my house, so you kind of have to do a little walk down the stairs to uh, to find the space, but I always try to put up little things in the front entryway just to kind of say like, I'm a musician, you know? <laughs> so it's really cool that you can make that that sort of entrance there. But yeah, let's talk a little bit more about your, your music space. I mean, for, for me, what I remember your music space being was that Cleveland Institute of Music. I remember your your um, your studio there. And one thing that's actually worth mentioning, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, uh, just kind of going back uh, when I started um, uh, taking lessons from you, uh, and I couldn't believe this. You know, I really had to go back in time. Age thirteen, Encore School for Strings. Those were during the summers, and I think it was maybe four or five summers. And during that time, uh, you. 
Uh, I remember you were speaking with my parents about um, you know, the possibility of me coming to Young Artist Program at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And those years would have been age 16 to 19. So really uh, a lot of my, my teen years um, where we uh, work together. So I, I just wanted to give people like a little time frame of, of the, what that time span was. That's pretty incredible. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of history together. But uh, let's um, go uh, to your, your studio now. Um, and I, I was hoping that you, uh, maybe if, if you didn't know how to answer this before, you'd probably be able to answer it now. Uh, in your own words, how would you describe a classical musician's studio or any an instrumentalist studio? Well, it was probably the, the space where we do our communing with our art and it's where all the mental work happens. It's, it's a familiar, comfortable space that uh, maybe is in either, either inspiring by the things that are in it, or maybe it's so stark that it allows our work to be the focus, you know, but it's the place where we, where we go to. Mm. It's our, sort of our laboratory where we do our experiments and we, we learn our music, our programs, we go through trial and error. And over years, I've found, at least in my case, and in the case of some of my colleagues, we put sort of trophies on our wall, trophies of memories. Mm. You know, the places that the music has taken us or special experiences that have happened because of the music. And so we come back to this space as a familiar place to do our continued learning and our passing on of our own legacy to other students. Yeah, it, I've, I've got a great question to ask to do exactly what you were talking about, those memories with people, but we'll get to that later. But I think that's really uh, something that, um, especially when you look at the, the wall of a lot of musician studios, you do see those human interaction memories. And that's really, um, that's really something special. I know you probably have something to say about that. We'll get to that later. Um, sure. But thanks for mentioning that. Um, and I, I think you, you really covered what your music studio was to you um, personally. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful description. Anything to add to that or? Well, uh, I find that so fascinating that if, you know, I didn't really decorate this room out of a sense of ego. I did it more because I remembered how my teacher's studios kind of grew out of their life experience. And we felt that the whole place was somehow, you know, teaching us something. I, I remember, for instance, you know, the, the, the Galamian studio up at uh, Meadowmount had all these beautiful Persian rugs. And it gave, it was such a sense of, of the quality of everything. At least that's what I took away from it. But of course he was born in Tabriz, Persia where those rugs were made. And I think maybe that had more to do with it than you know, I'm going to decorate a beautiful space. It was an extension of himself or his personality. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. my first teacher, she had a studio that I, I can still remember every detail of it. And uh, so I, I, I like to think that the space around us it gets organized because of who we are. And uh, we pass that along at a subliminal level to anybody who enters that space. That's really interesting. Wow. And you know what, that's a perfect segue to the next question because, um, you know, one thing I've been thinking about to ask a lot of musicians is that, is there anything you, like a focal point, anything you stare at while practicing, either distracting or inspirational, uh, like a picture on the wall or my, another example I've given before, was a pattern on a rug. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I do my utmost to not stare away from anything that isn't my fingers or the sounding point on the violin. Yeah. Just to keep my focus and uh, keep the work very efficient and, you know, my concentration where it needs to be. 
there, of course, when you're memorizing a piece, sometimes I've had the habit of walking in circles around the room, you know, and then of course your attention focuses on other things a little bit as you're integrating your memory into your body so that you can replicate this performance over and over. And it's funny what happens at those times, sometimes when you're out on stage, finally doing the performance, a, a mental picture of what you were looking at will go across your mind. Yeah, that's true. So, I don't know, I think um, the last thing that I seriously studied in this room was the Inescu Third Sonata. And there's so much detail in that, that the only thing I was staring at was that music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, um, it, I, this could actually be kind of a, a, a two-parter question here. Um, uh, would you consider your studio to be a common place or a more private place for work? And once you uh, answer that, maybe you could show us something you're comfortable showing us, either an artifact or a musical collectible that you would be very open to showing uh, s someone that came to visit your studio? I'd be happy to. Well, you know, the, the music studio is a very, in my house, is a very, it, it's a workspace, mm. even though it's right at the front entrance and there's sort of a decorative aspect to it. It's, it's really all about the work and that's all it's used for. And, but it is across from the dining room over there. Mm. Um, but so I, there have been occasions that when we'll have guests that spontaneously in conversation, a piece of music or a memory will come up and we'll come across over here and play music that yeah. uh, reminds us of those times or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's great you can actually open up your, your music space this way, as well as it being private. It seems like it kind of covers both aspects. You know, when it's, you know, when it worked there, and then it can also be very hospitable and you can open it up to people and really share in that music. I think that's a great. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, we can't forget that that's why we do this, mm. you know, ultimately, yeah. especially, and that's driving home the point in this time of quarantine. You know, you talk, all, all you hear anymore is about essential and non-essential mm. jobs. If yeah. there is a more essential job than music to humanity, I'd be hard pressed to name it, mm. especially in times like this. So, you know, anything that fosters an open um, opportunity to share music in a meaningful way, I think, Great, let's go for it. You yeah. wanted to see something that was meaningful? Yeah. I, I keep on my piano. Well, I tell you, we're talking about the human thing. Yeah, yeah. And actually, what, what you just said, I think that's really great because it's, you know, we, we find ways, we also have to take care of ourselves. Each individual person has to take care of themselves. And for a lot of people, music really does something. I mean, we, you know, we try to search the words to describe it sometimes. And, you know, we, uh, it it uh, sometimes it changes and sometimes we find deeper meaning, but to really, you know, take care of what's inside of us. I think that's something really great that music does. And I think going out and doing what we do, even if we're like a front on the front lines, you know, uh, keeping that kind of, you know, uh, perspective on, on humanity, music really strengthens that. I think in anything we do, that's a, a beautiful foundation for, for human beings. Beautifully said, Mark. That's really beautifully said. I, I, I that is a perfect lead into a couple of pictures that I have here. All right, let's do it. <laughs> First, I keep two pictures that were gifts from my friend, my very dear friend and colleague Andres Cardenas. Um, he gave me this this picture of Fritz Kreisler. I, I hope you can see it. Oh yeah. It's very serious Chrysler. But here's the thing. This is the one that I really love. This is the more human looking Fritz Chrysler with his puppy. There you go. <laughs> oh. And with a really funny look on his face too. It mm -hmm. reminds me, well, and, and this one too, which was a gift from Andres Cardenas, who says the great David Oistrach with his kitties. Oh, so he was a cat person. Wow. I guess so. 
But you know, the thing is that that reminds me uh, that these immortals in our profession were first human beings. Mm -hmm. And whatever came out of them that made them the immortals of our profession started from their humanity. And yeah. so that's why these, these pictures are important to me in my studio. And this one, this thing I keep here, this is an old program from Meadow Mount. Uh, in 1978, it was the Benefit concert. And in the back is a beautiful, I hope you can tell me if you can see this. Uh, yeah, hold that up a little higher. I see the, the music that's written there, the notations, and then the words, the writing I am trying to make out. Maybe you could read it. This was a beautiful inscription that Joseph Gingold wrote in the back of my program. Wow. He, he, this was my very first quartet experience, and he was my very first quartet coach, if you can imagine that. Wow, that's amazing. And it was the Schumann A minor quartet, which is <laughs> a formidable piece. But um, he inscribed the opening of the first violin line of the Schumann A minor quartet and wrote, best wishes for a beautiful musical life, Joseph Gingo. That's amazing. Wow. He's probably pro at, uh, at a melodic dictation. If you could just uh, write it that quickly, like a signature. His mind was incredible. He knew all four parts to just about every string quartet written and most symphonies too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's really, that, that's really quite impressive that you've, you've held on to those things. And I think that's half the battle there is actually when, you know, um, uh, musicians write these things on like programs or music, it's really holding on to them and they just become more valuable over time as you've demonstrated uh, uh, right here. Um, and, you know, you showed us a lot of sheet music around the, the studio. Do you have um, uh, any, uh, uh, pieces of uh, sheet music, you know, uh, that are mean a lot to you. And for uh, some of our viewers uh, who are either music enthusiasts or just learning their love of music, uh, one thing you can definitely uh, understand is that, um, you know, sheet music is very expensive. Not only that, we keep it all our lives. It has a lot of value and has a lot of significant memory. So any pieces of sheet music you want to share? Well, I... You know, I, I have all of this over here. Um, it's rather disorganized. These are all concertos, and these are some short pieces. Uh, sonatas here, and chamber music on the bottom. And But, uh, you know, I think when I think about the really special pieces of music that I have, they're more like um, a snapshot from history. Because, you know, music is an evolving thing, and even though you might have a great musician's markings or comments written into them, you know, that becomes like a, a very, very important uh, museum piece. But the music is a living and evolving thing. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a danger of, of kind of trapping ourselves in, in one thing that was written at the time. But I, I do look back on some of those great musicians' handwritings in my music to yeah. get an overview of an idea and the expression that was going for it, you know, that it was going for. And you could probably tell the mood of the lesson by how hard, you know, they, they pushed the pencil down on the paper or how light it was. It was a very light marking, it was probably light pencil, but if you know, if it was a tough lesson, man, it was... I don't know if I could find oh. anything. I generally bury those, um, those manuscripts just for their own safety, but yeah. I do remember on the top of the C major Bach sonata in the fugue, a teacher had written a skull and crossbones across the top and said, bow speed and pressure equals, and then the skull and crossbones. In other words, <laughs> I guess I was pressing too hard. Oh my God, that's <laughs> so hilarious. Find that's... That, but it was, a, it was a humorous thing to look back on. That's, a, that's awesome. Another teacher used colored pencils all the time until the Bach edition kind of looked like Walt Disney threw up on it or something. Yeah, oh my God. Well, <laughs> some of my early parts have a lot of colored pencil marked in it, but that was, 
you know, that's because sometimes, you know, hearing it once wasn't enough. And then, you know, you got to color coordinate things. It's very, it's interesting how, you know, some, some of the music from when I was really, really young versus, you know, uh, present day has less uh, detailed markings just because you kind of get used to seeing them. So I, I think that's really interesting how, what, what you mentioned there. Um, actually, it, it kind of brings me to my next uh, question. Anything in your studio it, you find you just use all the time besides your violin uh, and then something you haven't used in years where you're wondering to yourself, what is that still doing in here? Uh, well, I think there's two things that I use in my studio other than my violin all the time. And one is this chair. <laughs> I came from, uh, uh, can you see the chair? Yeah, yeah. it kind of camouflaged with the carpet, but yeah, I see it. And, and there's this pillow with a monkey on it. And that is a, is a message to myself that sometimes as a teacher, the best policy is monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> demonstrate and you don't have to talk about it that's awesome actually the the um banner for the this particular show in this episode uh really show it actually looks like you're you're giving me a lesson because you're pointing your violin at me i was just actually realizing that as as i was looking at it before the interview i think that's great i, I you know mark you you and i both came from a generation of teachers that pretty much taught sitting down mm. uh Maybe that's because they were getting older in years or something, but I don't know. I think it's a way of pouring the energy into the student, you know, and focusing your eyes on what they're doing. Well, the other thing that I use is surprising. The other thing that I use most frequently in the studio is the piano. Okay. Not to teach so much, but to move away from the violin and the seriousness of the music. This is sort of a, a secondary place for me that I come just for myself that I don't have to have anybody else hear the result of the music but I just I play Bach on the piano mm. just to uh, just for my own sake that's and awesome the least, the least used thing anymore I think is is this cowbell <laughs> oh come on that should be gotta play more cowbell <laughs> There's a story behind that at my Adirondack master class. Um, I, I remembered growing up with a memory of Mrs. Galamian using a cowbell, shaking this cowbell out her window to get your attention. Mm. And it was the most obnoxious sound. So I incorporated it into my Adirondack master class to wake up the students in time for breakfast so they'd be, all be practicing by 8 a.m. That's fantastic. And so, but I haven't used that in a while. So I'm going to have some more made because I plan to do that masterclass again next, next summer. Yeah, don't forget the cowbell. I'll remind you to, to pack it in your, your luggage. Uh, that was a wonderful tour of your studio there. By the way, my, my mom is watching this. She's a pianist. So I know that she was giving the thumbs up on the, the, uh, the piano being the, the, one of the most oh, used things go. in there. So. Yeah, she was a wonderful. Uh, we worked together in Cleveland when she would come in to your lessons sometimes. I remember the Tchaikovsky concerto that she played with you, and that was some years ago, but it was, she's a marvelous musician. Oh, yeah, yeah. and then she, she knew a lot of those, um, those parts inside and out from, from years past, so uh, that's, that's really incredible. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for, thanks for uh, digging up that memory. That's fantastic. You know, we have about nine minutes left, and I kind of like to to um, just ask like a few more questions. This is a chance for, for you as a musician uh, to, to speak and reflect on uh, being a musician. And this is kind of more of a creative question. You're in Charlotte, North Carolina now. I was wondering, especially now that uh, traveling is a little uh, more difficult nowadays, uh, we can't just get up and go, uh, traveling is a huge deal. Uh, what piece of music or song, in your opinion, would best describe life there if we can't quite make it there? In Charlotte, North Carolina, what piece of music would best describe life here? Hmm. 
Well, I, um, <laughs> Is it a funny answer or creative okay. or spur of the moment. <laughs> Thanks for that permission because I live three miles from the Charlotte Motor Speedway where NASCAR does their races. And there's a certain culture <laughs> that is attracted, you know, the RV culture and the yeah. people turn out by the thousands for those races. So I, I think if any one thing comes to mind, it would be the soundtrack to the movie Talladega Nights, the ballad of Ricky Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's a wonderful, oh, the, the, the comedian who was so, Will Ferrell. Yeah, yeah. It is a classically hilarious movie. And some of, it was, some of it was filmed over at that speedway. And I tell you, driving in Charlotte, I think that presence of the speedway has an influence on the other drivers. They're all trying to get there sooner. And it's like being at the speedway when you're driving around. So I think that, that, that one piece, if we have to say, that, that whole soundtrack to the movie, Talladega Nights, would say, that's Charlotte. Wow, well, yeah. we, we have a Formula One racing track here. So, uh, and it, as I know, especially when the, the warm weather comes, everybody's a uh, race car driver. And, you know, sometimes the slowest cars go the fastest, you know. <laughs> so the Lamborghinis oh, yeah. drive very slow and carefully. And then, you know, uh, I don't want to get sued by a car company, but, you know, some like small little hatchbacks are just like, boom, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> Real, that's good inspiration. Um, maybe you could show us a little something you've been doing under um, un under whatever the lockdown situation is. There, have you, have you picked up any any hobbies or anything you're just continuing doing at home? Well, I, I you know, when I've gone around to the world, really, to give master classes, and I've created the master classes, like Master Class Al Andalus in Spain and judged in some international competitions and things. The thing that I bring home with me is the memory of the food that I encounter there. And I've spent a lot of time in the kitchen trying to recreate some of the amazing food. Um, so I remember a Moroccan dish that a, a wonderful friend of mine and I discovered in the Alpujarras area of the mountains outside of Granada. And I, I every time I try to make that I try to live up to the memory of that day when we discovered that Moroccan chicken dish with uh, dried fruit and uh, it, had, it had olives and dates and dried apricots and plums and toasted almonds. It's the most incredible, and Moroccan spices, oh my gosh. So I've been spending a lot of time cooking and, and gaining weight. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've been spending time outside in the garden yeah. Um, this is the view, from not my garden so much, but I have roses outside my studio window that have been wow. doing well. And I've got a Spanish garden. See, the, this from from my time in Spain, I have a lot of memories on the wall. Yeah. But I, I have a Spanish garden, and I, um. Although I don't get to do this during the quarantine, I, I picked up a hobby while teaching in Israel uh, at Keshet Elon, the archery. Okay, um, yes. I, I remember you you were um, uh, always a, a bow enthusiast in more than one way, violent bow and bow and arrow. That's right. Yeah. Which archery. <laughs> can, uh, it can also provide the opportunity to bring I'll, I'll try to phrase this delicately, to bring home organic meat to yeah. prepare in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what fantastic. <laughs> I have done on a, on a few occasions, and, but it is um, really for, for, the, for the right reasons, not for, you know. I, I remember at a studio party actually trying venison for the first time, so you really actually harvest what you... Uh, uh, what you come, which I think is really fantastic. And just having that real outlook on where our meat comes from, I think that's, that's really fantastic, so. It is a reality, you know, that, that we, we do eat these things. And the thing is, I love to create wonderful recipes and share them with people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've, been, uh, I've been enjoying that and the gardening and the uh, uh, planning even though, unfortunately, the Masterclass Al-Andalus had to be postponed to next year, 
I'm already planning for it next year. So I'm spending a lot of time on the computer doing some uh, thinking about it. Yeah, you know, speaking of master classes and studio classes, this is, I think, something for our non musicians and new music enthusiasts. Um, I remember your studio classes very well at the Cleveland Institute of Music, and I remember everyone was very active in it. You really kind of got everyone to, to speak and uh, make, um, you know, to try their best to make comments about performances that they heard. Do you think, um, it is, especially nowadays, do you think there's something important that a non musicians could learn from watching a violin studio class or any instrument uh, class? Absolutely, I do. And I, I you know, um, you probably remember from my violin classes that I always insist that the students begin their comments first with something that they appreciated in particular about the performance or the performer's way of performing, but something positive. And then if they wish, they can give a, a creative, I mean, a um, constructive, a positively framed constructive remark mm -hmm. to help them along. And the reason I do that is because I think it's, we train ourselves to feel how the, our audience is going to respond to us. If we are first critical and very negative with our assessments of our colleagues and friends or anything that we encounter in life, mm -hmm. then we can only expect that when we go out into the world that the people we interact with are going to see us the same way and be judging us and evaluating us the same way. So yeah. I think it's very important to lead off with the things that we appreciate the most about the person standing in front of us, yeah. the person who's willing to be vulnerable enough to open themselves in, in, in such a way, performing, or just in going about life. Uh, as we move about this world, I think it's much nicer to go out with the feeling that people are going to first appreciate us rather than try to destroy us competitively or just negatively. So we train our selves to see the world in the way that we see, we train ourselves to see other people. You know, that's how we're going to experience and anticipate people are going to see us. Yeah, I yeah, know. And that's, that's really, really well said. Actually, that's a lot of things to think about for, for anyone who's watching this and for them to share with their friends and, uh, and their colleagues. I sure hope they do that. You know, if asked today, um, you know, this is a question I'm sure you've heard a lot in interviews. Um, you know, everyone says, you know, how, how is music important to society? I mean, even uh, there's a lot of quotes about how music will save the world. Um, and, you know, what, what would be your, your answer to how music is uh, important to us? It seems like you kind of touched on it already. And just to kind of throw in uh, a, a bit of a wild card in there too, how would it, uh, do you think your answer would have been different uh, maybe like 20 years ago from today? I love this question, Mark. I really do. I once gave a lecture recital in Cordoba, Spain, at, a, at the Fundación Miguel Castillejo. I remember it very well because the topic it was, it was about um, life, meaning, and music. And I quoted... Fritz Kreisler, who had been a soldier in World War I. And, you know, he had a bad experience being a soldier and he saw combat and everything and was injured. And he wrote about that experience in his memoirs when he said that somehow he felt that after that war, the music was never to be appreciated or valued in quite the same way that it was before that war, when the world was more innocent. Mm -hmm. And the premise of my whole lecture recital that day in Cordoba was that at such times, the music becomes even more 
important to our mm -hmm. lives and that I understand what he was trying to say. But I, I do believe that the worse things become in the world, the more important our role in it to remind us that hope is there and beauty still is there and uh, communication at such an unspoken level as music offers, that's still there. And so in this really awkward and strange and temporary time of COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, I think it gives us an opportunity to look at music and, and art and human relationships and uh, come out of it better and yeah. stronger. Yeah, really well said. Yeah, yeah. They did. Now, I think, uh, you know, from, from your answers there, I think you really gave viewers um, a, a true insight into what um, a music teacher is not only teaching instruction about the instrument, uh, but just about how it, um, how it's so important to life. And, you know, this is something from an early age, my father uh, worked uh, with me and, you know, really showed me just like the, you know, the wonderful potential of having music in your life. And it was definitely something that boosted the relationship between uh, my entire family. Since we were all musicians, we got to play music together. And, um, you know, hearing this coming from you and, and uh, from your experience as a, as a teacher really kind of touches on something from my, my childhood. And I, I really believe in what, what you said there. And I think, um, you know, if given the, given the, the question, how will music save the world? I think you really, um, really kind of nailed that, that answer right there. You know, it, it's, it's something, even if we can't quite find the words for it, although it seems like you really did, it's really, yeah, in, in that experience and you have to experience it. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, with our, our uh, viewers and listeners. You're most welcome. I, um, I think that the, the most important thing that we actually do in the big picture yeah, uh, absolutely. This has been a really fun chat and, you know, it's been great uh, reconnecting. I know we, we've kept in touch. Uh, I'd like to end on a kind of a fun um, note here. <laughs> if any of the viewers watching this uh, are guitarists, I'd really like to thank you for, uh, for staying tuned in because probably some of you thought in the guitar world, when you think of David Russell, you think of the, the famous guitarist, David Russell. There's two big names in, in music for guitar and violin. It's David Russell on violin, David Russell on guitar. And I think it'd be fun to end uh, this chat. Could you ever see a duo concert with the two David Russells of music, violin and guitar? I would so love that. You know, we were in the same building one time at, at CIM, at Cleveland Institute of Music. He was giving a master class and I so wanted to go, but I was teaching right through it and I missed him I couldn't uh, and compounding matters uh, difficulties of con confusion about our names and all of that is that my master class in Spain is for violin and he has one in Spain for guitar yeah so I've shown up for interviews in Portugal at a radio station once where they had the whole discography of David Russell the the guitarist ready to go and I had to well know we're going to shift gears here <laughs> but I would love to to do something with him sometime he's absolutely one of the greats and um, marvelous he's Scottish but living in Spain and yeah. of course I have the master class in Spain and my heritage is Scottish which That's is incredible wow yeah wow this yeah. would be good. <laughs> it, it would be nice to see that happen someday. I think violinists and guitarists alike would uh, would uh, come to that concert. You might have to do uh, to do three three sold out shows to see the, the two David Russells in concert. So let's that, if you are watching this David Russell on guitar, let's make this happen. <laughs> well, we'll see if it should ever transpire. I would be so willing. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you so much again. I, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend, and let's continue to to keep in touch and thank you for sharing uh, just everything um, with uh, with our, our viewers. You know, as classical musicians, it's, you know, some sometimes we, you know, most of the time we really stick to our playing as our communication, but to actually 
hear you speak and uh, really give a lot from, from the soul and share your personal space. It really means a lot to, uh, to the viewers and musicians and uh, people who are just uh, coming to discovering music. So I think this has been really fantastic. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I think it's brilliant what you're doing. And I'm, I'm, it, it should go without saying I'm so very proud of your successes as a violinist and a musician. And now you're extending this into the larger human realm. And I'm just, just very, very happy for seeing yeah. that. Oh, well, th thank you for so many years of uh, dedication and teaching. I, uh, again, I appreciate it uh, all the time. And uh, I, I hope to talk with you again soon. See you soon, Mark. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.